the weather outside is frightful. What are the special concerns for those of us who live where winter visits with an enthusiastic vigor? We are on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. With below zero temperatures keeping us stuck inside, seasonal affective disorder and the cold and flu season are reaching our, their peak. And, and we're having rapidly changing weather that can affect driving conditions or even our safety walking down the sidewalk. With all this, it is even more important to take steps to stay active, safe, healthy. Tonight we discuss everything dealing with winter health and feel free to call and ask questions about anything. This is an ask anything of our panel. Stump these people. See if you can get them a question they don't know. We have a good group that has a wide breadth of knowledge to answer your questions. I am joined tonight by surgeon Dr. Mary Milroy, a general surgeon at the Avera Sacred Heart Hospital, Yankton, South Dakota, and internist Dan Meegard, an internist from the Yankton Medical Clinic. Thank you both for, for joining us and coming up from Yankton. Actually, we're both partners at the Yankton yeah. Medical Clinic. Yes, so, there yeah. you go, So partners. we've actually worked together for more than 20 years. 23 so. years. 23. 23 years. So we have an internist and we have a surgeon. Yep. I can challenge you. There isn't anything you can ask them that they don't know something about almost. Maybe. Maybe. We hope so. <laughs> <laughs> we do hope so. So, Mary, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from originally? Well, I actually was born in uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba, but my folks oh. moved down to the States uh, when I was about three years old. So you can't and be the president of the United States? No. You're Canadian. Like I would want to, oh. like, right? No, <laughs> that's not my goal. <laughs> but that's not on my bucket list. But um, anyway, I, I grew up mostly in Minnesota, went to University of Minnesota as an undergraduate but did attend medical school in South Dakota. So I had a chance to uh, move to Vermilion and loved it. You spent uh, some, time it. In, some time in Brookings. I did. I think my first family medicine rotation was in Brookings. With whom? Pat, Walt Pat, did you say? And I'm gonna say, I'm not sure exactly. I think they rotated us around quite a bit, yeah. So, but it was good. So, and then you and, did your uh, fellowship and then in, or I, residency in surgery. Okay, and, and actually I married a classmate, fell in love with South Dakota, and so it's been great. I'm uh, now a transplanted to South Dakota person. So you are truly and a South Dakotan. I'm truly a South Dakotan. And then I, I did a, a year of internship out at Highland Alameda County in Oakland. So I, I did a first year surgery out there and then spent three years with the um, U.S. Public Health Service. And I was at oh, the wow. Indian Health Service Hospital up in Sisseton. So I actually did real medicine, uh, like Non-surgical Non-surgical real medicine for about three years. And I decided that I truly did like surgery. So I went to uh, Michigan State and completed a surgical residency. I uh, stayed and taught there for two years on the faculty. And uh, then really wanted to move back to South Dakota. I was done training, wanted to move home. And uh, actually Yankton was about the first place we looked. And I nice must have fit because I've still been there 23 yeah. years later, so, so it's been you, good. And you evolved as a general surgeon in, into breast right. surgery. Tell us a little right. bit about that. Yes, I found that as I was uh, practicing, uh, many women did want to see me. I think when I moved to the state, I was only the second woman general surgeon in the state. I, I, so yeah. uh, women really wanted to see me when they were having issues with their breasts or their mammograms. And at the time, I also had a small family, and so uh, it was more of a clinic practice than regular general surgery. It didn't have so much trauma and things. Yeah. So um, I found that it was a wonderful fit. It was something I enjoyed doing. It seemed it was something that women appreciated, and it fit very well with the family. I mean, so. and I, it, it, earlier we talked about stereotactic surgery and all those localizations of lesions and so on and yeah. so forth. It just amazes me that what, what we can do now oh, with breast amazing. cancer. Oh, amazing. You know, I often t tell some of the pre-med students and the, the medical students, you know, so much of what I trained uh, is, has completely changed. You know, when I started, and I'll have to tell you a story, this is, um, when I started, one of my first times in residency, we were still doing um, if a woman came in with a lump, mammograms weren't done as much then, a woman would come in, she would sign a consent that was for a biopsy, frozen section, possible mastectomy. Yeah. So sometimes we would give women a general anesthetic, they would go to sleep, they would wake up not knowing if they had cancer, had they had a mastectomy, 
what happened? And women would be tearful in the recovery room. Yeah. What happened to me? Yeah. You know, nowadays we want our patients to be active participants in their care and their decisions. Yeah. And I look at that and I think, oh, wow, that's not the way we do it now. I said, when yeah. I look now, the majority, well, the good news is that the breast cancer mortality rate has gone down almost every year now for two decades and that's due to a couple different things. One is early diagnosis. I mean, I think people are more aware, they have mammograms. It also opens avenues to have lumpectomies. The majority of my breast cancer patients don't spend one night in the hospital, they have their lumpectomy and go home. And the, and the and, radiation, and, and they, don't need, they don't lose their breast. They anymore. don't lose their breast. Uh, they can have radiation, don't lose, they save their breast, they have a better outcome, it's great. Also, some of the advances in um, Diagnosis, we do so much of it by image guided where you can have a small office procedure versus going to surgery for a biopsy. And then some of the major advances in some of our medical oncology, between uh, kind of the early diagnosis and that, it has made a dramatic change. So things are better. We're not perfect yet, and, and the goal is uh, no deaths, but uh, it's marching the right way. Right. Um, it's an Ask an Anything show, so call us at one. 888-376-6225 or email your questions to ask at oncalltv.org. So Dan, <clears throat> you're from where originally? The big city of Sherman, South Dakota. Right. Sherman. You're familiar with Sherman? No, I'm not. No. <laughs> I don't re remember where Sherman. I've Sherman, heard that. Sherman is about three miles north of Gerritsen. Um, the big, bigger city. The big Gerritsen. city of Gerritsen, but I went to the metropolis of Del Rapids, the high school. Um, and uh, from there, I went to... <clears throat> Are you a farm kid? I'm a farm kid. I uh, okay. grew up on the farm, and actually we showed cattle and hogs all over the upper Midwest, so mm -hmm. I uh, very much was uh, about that far from becoming a farmer. Mm -hmm. um, the only son of a farm family. And then uh, went and from... They, and you disappointed them. Uh, in in pressure, many ways. Oh. This is probably one of the few, <laughs> maybe the only profession I could go into. Maybe <clears throat> veterinary medicine would be the only one that would be considered an option that would be acceptable. Um, but then I came up to campus here at SDSU. And go Jacks. Went, <laughs> went, I was a rabbit for four years. And uh, then went to USD to medical school. And then three years at the University of Missouri for residency. Oh, yeah. And... Um, and then after residency, I worked as a hospitalist, or at that time would be called an intensivist. Yeah. I worked mm -hmm. in an IC, ICUs in St. Louis for six months. Oh wow, um, I bet that was a good that was That yeah. was uh, very interesting and very intense. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. We did bypass surgery, so I would take care of post-bypass mm -hmm. patients you know, immediately after right. their surgery and, and all kinds of other things in an intensive care unit. Uh, very intense, uh, very fun, but I knew that was a temporary job because I'd already signed to come back to Yankton and the Yankton Medical okay. Clinic. And, um, and so I did that for six months because I was waiting to get married in Missouri. Oh. Okay. And then you dragged that poor woman back to South Dakota. <laughs> Drove her back, <coughs> drug her back here to the beautiful weather and the nice people. Yeah, that, I did that same yeah. thing to a Floridian, the poor lady. That's even, Scratch, that's even <laughs> Scratch marks all the way yeah, from Florida. I'm sure. I, I think I passed him on I-29, actually, on yeah. the way up. So do you... Um, do any hospital work now, or are you mostly outpatient? Out um, right? We have uh, what I would call an infancy hospital program in uh, Yankton. We have a 12-hour hospitalist program, uh, which just doesn't have enough physicians in it yet to take care of all of our patients. So I still do both inpatient and outpatient yeah. medicine. My trend is is probably leaning more towards outpatient. You know, every year that I practice, yeah. but uh, still, uh, I still have a significant. Uh, uh, component of patients in the hospital, yeah. including yeah. this week. There's more yeah, than yeah. more than enough You're there. You're busy this week. Yes. I am too. I do both, mm -hmm. just like you do. And I think it, the, moving toward the hospitalist system, I think we lose something, I'm yeah. afraid. But that's a bias, and, and it's nice to have somebody available and to be able to mm -hmm. get some sleep too. Right. Mm -hmm. We talk about the flu, arthritis, psoriasis, et cetera, but often a disease can show itself in different ways. Pneumonia can arrive in a variety of forms, and it's important that we know the variety with which we are dealing in order to provide you effective treatment. Well, I've been in practice for um, almost 29 years after residency, so I had a number of interesting cases here and there. One that's most recent that I remember um, it was actually a family member of one of our office staff, and uh, he was he works as a, a welder and a, a machinist, so he's 
pretty heavy duty guy and uh, he'd been ill for a week and of course didn't come in until he was all but passing out and had fever and chills and was extremely weak and dehydrated and was really ill and uh, had respiratory symptoms and he was starting to get jaundiced and he was very ill. So we put him in the hospital. Um, he had uh, a pneumonia, which was somewhat atypical. It had different areas of involvement, not just one local area. And so we put him on our, you know, we usually start with a shotgun approach where you put on multiple antibiotics to cover pretty much everything until you figure out what it is. And you do cultures in the meantime to figure out what it is, try and culture sputum, culture blood, culture whatever you can to find out what the organism is and we did that but that takes a couple days or a day or two and um, we also involved infectious disease specialists which we do now via telemedicine we use an interactive video setup and um, they can interview the patient and um, of course some of it is secondhand they get information but they assisted and ordered some other tests too and Anyway, what it turned out to be was a case of uh, Legionella or Legionnaire's disease, which we don't see very often at all and certainly don't in our part of the country. Um, it had, uh, well, it was originally described at a, as a Legionnaire's uh, convention, her Legion convention, where they had uh, contaminated um, airflow ductwork and got it through that type of infection. but. We couldn't pin down how this individual got it, but uh, very interesting. But um, our initial antibiotics got him started getting better, and then we got more focused when we uh, found out what it was, and he recovered uneventfully. So it was a good case. That was Kevin Bjordahl, you yeah. know, he's from DeSmet, you know. I, I good know guy. him, yeah. he's a good guy. So, I've heard good things about DeSmet. So, uh, uh, interesting, I've had a case or two or three of Legionnaires in my yes. experience, always waterborne, sometimes air conditioners and so yeah. on and so forth. Yeah. And uh, what would, you, you had a case? I've had, I've seen two cases I can think of off the top of my head. One would have been in the 80s, um, you know, not too long after Legionnaires had been described. Right. And uh, it was a young kid from a military base who actually ended up dying from it. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we knew what it was. Uh, I'm not sure we knew exactly how to treat it. And he, he, he died from Legionnaires pneumonia. I had another case here just a few years ago that uh, you know we, we covered them for Legionnaires right away and they did very well. And they do, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting, uh, we have a lot of respiratory infections. I have a cold right now and my I, I feel fine. I have a little bit of a cough. And the clue that it's virus is it hits the voice. Yeah. Yep. The voice is mm -hmm. gone, you know, then the, the antibiotic doesn't make it a difference. It doesn't do a thing. Yep. Some people say, well, if, if it's a virus and I'm really sick from this, why don't you just give me an antibiotic in case? And I've read experts that said, that it doesn't prevent the viral respiratory infection from going on to becoming bacterial. It only makes it a resistant organism. What do you think about the, that, you guys? I agree with that. I mean, I don't think you should prophylactically treat like that at all because most viral infections get better on their own. Yeah. You know, so. And when they turn bad, then you, you start having shakes and chills three days later, you call your doctor. Then you know what right. it is. Yeah. I think uh, a lot of people come in and say, you know, 20 years ago, my doctor used to give me a shot of penicillin in yeah. the backside, and I was better in two days. Yeah. Well, they probably weren't getting better because the, vi the virus went away and the penicillin did nothing for them. And, yeah. and we need to educate patients that, that that's not the way it works anymore, and we're not going to do that because it's not good medicine. Well, they, and it hurts. Yeah, they them. probably would have yeah. got better in two days without well, the of shot. Course they <laughs> so of course they would have. So they spared themselves the pain. Yeah. Well, and the problem is that, that now we're having these terrible overgrowth problems related to the antibiotics. Yeah, antibiotic resistance is becoming a real issue. So I think all of us need to be very careful with how we use our antibiotics. And I think part of that's educating our patients so that they realize that that probably is not the best way to practice medicine. No, pneumonia and, and, yep. and, and maybe that was, they didn't know better in those days because they didn't have antibiotic resistance, but now we shouldn't do that. We, we really have resistance. Mm -hmm. I had a friend who got a bad cold and he didn't 
let me know. He didn't tell anybody he was mm -hmm. sick, right? <clears throat> After about four days, he started having chills. Oh. And he still didn't let anybody oh, know. No. And he was, his, his pneumonia just about took him out. Um, yeah. So uh, it, it was bacterial pneumonia. We, we, he's alive. Saw him last yeah. night. Mm. Looks great. Good. And uh, thank goodness that we do have antibiotics that work yet. Yeah. Absolutely. Any other take-home messages on that? Or we're going to dive into some questions. Well, one thing I would say is I think people need to be careful because so many viruses are around, and it isn't fancy antibiotics that, that really make a difference in our health. I think it's simple things. It's things like washing your hands. It's things like staying home when you're sick. Cover so your you, cough. So that you don't spread it to everybody at the office or the school. Yeah. Cover your cough. Yeah. You know, it, it's, uh, those kind of really pretty simple, easy things make a yeah. huge difference. Yeah, they do. They Good do. common sense. And get the flu shot. And get your flu shot yeah. for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Saves lives. Oh, there are people yes. dying from flu. Oh, I think yeah. just driving here tonight, I heard on public, <clears throat> public radio I was listening to, they've had several young people die uh, of the flu. So get the flu shot. Yeah, yeah. even this year when it, it's, the, the word is it's not as effective and the virus has, has changed a little bit, the shot's not as effective this year, still get it. It's 50% it. effective. Mm -hmm. I had influenza six years ago. I thought I was gonna die. It, mm -hmm. It's awful. And if you get pneumonia on top of influenza, oh. it can be a killer. Yeah, yeah even at young, healthy people, it, yeah. it's it well worth count. getting. Oh, and definitely. And look at Jim Henson. I mean, he, he yes, died from right. pneumonia. But from I'm, pneumonia. I'm certain they say 90% of all the pneumonias start with a viral respiratory mm -hmm. infection. And then they don't start, they don't come in after Afterwards. three or four or five days when they start getting sick again. Get real sick. <clears throat> from Volga. Uh, okay. Good. Uh, can good cholesterol be too high? Uh, talking about HDL, oh. Dan. Okay. Absolutely not. The higher, the better. Uh, good cholesterol or HDL is protective. I saw somebody uh, earlier this week, uh, a lady who had an HDL, I believe, of 98. Oh, her total wow. cholesterol was about 230. Um, so her ratio between total and good was outstanding. Um, I, the higher the better with good cholesterol. Uh, you know, anything above 40 is, is kind of the goal. Above 60 is outstanding, and if you're up at 90 or 100, wow. more so, but, power to but you. But why is it? Do you have any idea why, what the theory is? Most of the time, I think, when people have really high good cholesterols, it's genetic. You're, yeah. you're blessed with the right genes that uh, you're gonna have high good cholesterol. Women, luckily, have better yeah. uh, genetics and have- Exercisers. Exercisers, Exercisers have good HDL, yeah. but, but still, yeah. you get those people that are up 80, 90, or 100, they are born with a genetic yeah. predisposition to have wonderful cholesterol, and, and you, can't, you can't ruin that. Okay. Uh, from Aurora, tell, tell me about fibroid tumors. What causes them, how, how to treat or live with them, or what not to do? Fibroid tumors, what okay. are they? Well, I would say Fireballs of the uterus <laughs> yeah. is what they used to say <laughs> yeah. in Atlanta, Georgia. Fireballs yeah. of the Fireball. uterus. Um, you know, I think that what happens is they're pretty common. They're often in the uterus, and um, I don't think anybody really knows why they form. Uh, for a, a number of women, they really are not a problem. Uh, they're fairly common, but some people do end up with um, heavy bleeding, and then, then it is important to go ahead and see your gynecologist because sometimes treatment does need to be I mean, necessary. And you can get large uteruses from fibroids. Oh, very from, large. Uh, fibroids. You bet. Sometimes some they can grow really to amazing sizes. Yeah. And benign, um, though. They're benign right, they're, tumors. They're benign. They're benign. I think one in, sometimes I get people that come in and they have a fibroadenoma in their breast, and they get very confused. They're actually different entities, but they are another kind of fibrous. We don't know why they form. And benign. Usually benign, uh, benign and usually no problem, and uh, sometimes you can just let them be. So. Okay. From Yankton. Okay. You're home. All right. A 76-year-old man said pneumonia shot sent uh it had several years ago uh uh to be once now here's there is a booster oh a pneumonia yeah, shot pneumonia yeah. shot so yeah. tell us about pneumonia shots dan and there is new word about the prevnar which is the other pneumonia shot right pneumovax and prevnar and sh shingle shot so yeah. hit us okay. on, on all three well, of them. Well, let's start with the, the two pneumonia shots. Uh, the pneumovax, or a 23-valent pneumonia shot, has been around a long time. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know. It's been longer than I've been in practice. I'd say 30, 
or more years, yeah. Rick. I remember when it came in. Yeah. So yep. yeah, about yeah. thirty years. Thirty years, and and it's um, <clears throat> the the recommendations regarding that shot. I, I've been in Yankton twenty three years. The recommendations changed three times in the first yeah. five years I was in Yankton, and since then, uh, the last eighteen years, it's basically stayed the same. Uh, a, a second shot, uh, which is a thirteen valent. Uh, pneumonia shot has come so out. So it covers 13 different pneumonia. 13 strains of, of pneumococcal pneumonia, which is the most common type of pneumonia, versus the old shot was 23 strains. Right. This newer shot's been around a number of years now too, maybe, I don't know, 10 or something like that. Um, and the they both have their advantages. The, the 23 valent covers 23 strains of the most common type of pneumonia. The 13 valent covers 13 strains. You might say, well, 23 has got to be better than 13. At least in Del Rapids math it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then, uh, but <clears throat> apparently the, the immune response to the 13 is better for those 13 than it is for the 23. So they each have their own advantage. The CDC, the Center for Disease Control, just came out and said, we think, you know, there's not enough evidence that you should probably have both. Um, and so the recommendations are if you've had the 23 valent, get the 13 valent also, but get it at least a year apart between the two. I think there's still some concerns about who's gonna pay for this. And so I've been telling my patients right now, let's wait and not, you know, let, let's make sure Medicare is gonna pay for it before right. we give the second one. I, what I've heard is the Prevnar, the 13, uh, is the one that they've been traditionally giving to the kiddies. And that's the one that has probably made the greatest difference because it's the illness in the kids that that uh, oh, sure. spreads to the adults, and if you can mm -hmm. prevent the illness in the kids, you save adults uh, their illness. And the adults, the older adults who get this, uh, their immune system is not as strong as the kiddies too. So I, I think you're right, particularly if you've got an illness like uh, uh, asthma or diabetes, Absolutely. then you get the two. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you have one of those diseases, uh, <laughs> asthma, diabetes, kidney failure, liver disease, even uh, chronic heart disease, a type of cancer, um, you should probably get uh, the pneumonia vaccine, you know, one or the other every five years. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and one quick word about uh, zo uh, uh, Zovirex. Zovirex. Z Zostavax? Zostavax. Or? Zostavax. Zostavax is the yeah. shingles vaccine, and it has been shown to reduce the chance of shingles by 62% in the next decade after you get it. It's a one time shot, it's recommended at age 60. Um, most Medicare D plans will cover about 75 to 80 percent of the cost of the shot. If you can get this shot for, un, it, it's an expensive shot, it's $350 or so, but most Part D plans, will, you get it for 75 bucks. Mm -hmm. If you get it for under 100 bucks, it's a great deal, get it. Yeah. The manufacturer would like you to get it starting at age 50. Insurance says 60, so get it at 60. Yeah, get it at 60. It reduces the post-herpetic neuralgia pain by 50 percent as well. Okay. Ask me if I've had it. Have you had it by chance? I have. And how was it? Well, I've not had any uh, shingles, so I'm glad. <laughs> and it was wonderful. Shingles are miserable. Terrible. I had my shot too, so I yeah. I don't want to. I've seen enough patients with shingles that I don't want it. Don't want to go there. I don't want yeah, to go no. there. The effective treatment for some diseases isn't a pill or a surgery. The proper course may be as simple as a pair of socks. <laughs> I had a. A sore on my ankle, right at the ankle bone. They called it an ulcer. Anyway, it got to be just like a hole the size of my fingernail, and it just wouldn't heal. Well, finally, Dr. Holm, after probably a couple years, said, let's try support hose. So we started with support hose, it took a while, yeah. probably two, three months, but all of a sudden it started healing up. And I haven't had any trouble since, but once in a while I feel oh, like it's a little bit tender there yet. Then I got varicose veins. That's another reason that I wear these. And it's so comforting. Before I had the restaurant, I was on my feet probably 16 hours a day. And my calf would get so sore and tender and ache. So I started wearing them and that that cured didn't cure the varicose veins, but it sure helped the pain. Yeah. So uh, and the left foot, the left leg, that's not any problems. So uh, 
it's the right right leg that I've got where the support holes for. Take your, your left hand down and your right hand to the side and bring that as far as you can up to your towards your toes. Then you take your thumb, get your three fingers down, and bring it over the heel, and your, your sock is resting on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. I can't tell you how many people I have who have trouble putting those darn things on and taking them off. They won't do it, and it is such a benefit. I mean, you know, those ulcers went away once you started treating them with support hose. I've had wonderful uh, results. I had one lady mad at me because I didn't start them soon enough. <laughs> once they got used to them, that's the issue. What, what, Dan, what's your experience on, on support hose? I think it's great, especially for the people that have venous stasis, venous insufficiency, uh, you know, varicose veins. It, it works really well in those situations. Right. Mm -hmm. Mary? Oh, I would agree. Some of these chronic ulcers take forever to heal. So if you can prevent them and heal them and not get them back, it is wonderful. And the hose is the, is the mm -hmm. key. Brookings, how effective is Tamiflu or other antivirals for treating viral infection? In particular, does it reduce the time of illness? Dan. Well, I might try that one. Uh, I think it varies from year to year. Uh, Tamiflu is typically fairly good for influenza A. It's not as good for influenza B. And so, and that's probably true of all antiviral agents for influenza in general. So it's not the easiest disease to treat. Um, there's also talk of shortcomings in the supply this year. And so probably if you're young and healthy and you get influenza, you probably won't be treated by your doctor. No. If you're older and not healthy, you probably will. I'll, yeah. I'll use Tamiflu if they're sick enough to be in the hospital. I'm not giving yeah. it out otherwise. Yep, yeah. I think that's a good policy. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Sioux Falls, cause of interstitial cystitis, some treatments, discuss treatment. Mary, interstitial cystitis, you know, bladder. Yeah. And you know, honestly, I don't do a lot with the bladder or other than, you know, if I have a patient that's having uh, much trouble with that, I usually have them see a good urologist yeah. because it can be a miserable problem, but it's not one that I really do much with. Okay. Do yeah. you do much with that? Or? Um, I've had a few cases. Uh, you know, typically what works best is intra-bladder infusions of some medicines you can actually give in the bladder that work fairly well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one, I think, is called Elmiron, uh, but I, I, once again, I don't have a lot of experience with it, but... People can be really miserable. It, it, really <clears throat> miserable with that. I've had one patient who was so miserable, they just took out her bladder and made a bladder from a pocket from her colon. Yeah. Sure. And, yeah. uh, or small intestine, I think, is what it was. That made a lot of difference. Mm -hmm. Here's uh, mixed uh, martial arts promoted by Sanford Health. Is this okay? What do you think of mixed martial arts? Uh, certainly not an expert on that by any means. Uh, you know, I think that uh, any type of physical uh, activity like that, um, you know, uh, there's always a chance to get hurt. It, it's no different than football without pads, I yeah. think. Yeah, well, Mary? And you know, I'd say if you find an activity, a physical activity that you enjoy, go for it. Yeah. It's great, That's get up, get moving, it's good. I've heard a lot said about Tai Chi as a perfect thing for an elderly yes. person, for example. But the, most important thing, I think, is that you stay active, that you're going, that you're you going. get out of the igloo, that you, yeah. you unless you're sick. Get well, off, the, get off yeah. the couch. Get, get off, off that couch. darn couch. Okay, and and do mixed martial arts, not traumatic martial arts. But. I, you know, it, it's just, you just got to find an activity that you like, and then it's not a chore. It's something you miss if you don't do it, and you want to go do it. So In, in China, we were there picking up our daughter, yes, and then we went yeah. back again. And in the mornings, if you go out and you go for a run early, they're out in the park doing these, you know, these... Uh, uh, you know, the Kung Fu posturing. Well, the Tai Chi. chi. They're doing the Tai Chi, and which is wonderful. And then there are people doing sword things, and there are people, I mean, it's just amazing. But they're out. But they're, they're out. They're doing you know, their stretching. You know, we had a very similar experience. My daughter was teaching in um, South Korea, and so we had the chance to go out in the morning, and we couldn't believe how many people were up, really elderly people. And they were all doing out, some, and they were doing, doing a lot stretch. of those stretches and balance. You know, a lot of elderly people have a great right. trouble with balance. Balance, range of motion. And you come And by. you're getting up, and you have a social contact. Yeah. You're out doing this together. You're out in the fresh right. air. You would come That's, by a company uh, that 
and all of their workers were all dressed They're all the same. out there. They were all out there doing their morning pre-work day exercise. Which is fabulous. We should all make it a part we, of our day. It it's is, great. They're ahead of us on that yeah, one. Yeah, that's that's one we should copy. Hill, Hills, Minnesota. Caller had a car accident. L1 vertebrae compression 20%. Is this likely to get better? What should she expect? Dan. Well, it's a, it's a pretty common injury. Uh, compression fractures of the spine are a common injury. We see it a lot. Um, you know, I think there's two different approaches there. Uh, one is that you can just wait it out, which has kind of been the way we've always done this. And, and most of the time, in about six weeks, the pain is going to be gone. And, and just like a broken bone, this is a broken bone, no different than breaking your wrist or your ankle or, or something else. But it's, but it's stable as a it, rule. It's, it's stable. It just hurts. It, it just hurts. And usually in about six weeks, it will heal. Um, at 20% compression, they might manage that conservatively. If it was compressed more, 50 or 80%, now they can go in and they can actually put some cement in there, re-expand that vertebrae, and decrease your pain quicker. Uh, you know, and but that, to the tune of $30,000 in a risk. That's uh, the only other yeah. thing. Yeah, and, and, and at 20%, they're probably not going to want to do that. I would, I would manage that conservatively. And try to stay uh, m moving. I think yeah. the most important thing is they go, oh, I've collapsed the vertebrae, I can't move, it hurts. Yep. And they don't move, and then they have pain forever. Yeah. If you get moving, you, it's mm -hmm. like pelvic fracture. you got to get them moving. Get yep. moving. Here on South Dakota, toxin has sleep. What is this uh, called, and how common is talking in the sleep, and what does it mean? Barry, you know anything about talking? I know nothing about talking Dan, in you your know sleep, everything. I guess, I, here. <laughs> I, I, I don't know much about talking in, in the sleep. I, I do think, though, that it's probably a pretty safe bet that it's not pathologic and doesn't require any pretty, intervention. Unless he's saying nasty things. Yes. Well, it depends about he's talking about other women or yeah. something. It'll be a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> depends on what he's saying, right? You know, there's a lot of sleep things that are weird. I mean, there's yeah, some there's times some where they, they start hitting their partner because they're yes. having a dream that they're being mm -hmm. attacked. And uh, it's dangerous for oh, their yes, partner. Right, right. Uh, but true. talking in the sleep, uh, I think it all depends upon what you're saying because yeah. then your partner might be hitting you. If, it, if yeah, you got to be careful what you say. Yeah. I, think. It does, I don't think it means anything except that we have a part of our brain that turns everything off when we fall asleep so that we don't sleepwalk. And there's yeah. things that can be happening that that turn off doesn't completely doesn't happen. Completely. And mm -hmm. so I think getting correct sleep, certainly sleep apnea needs to be looked into. Drugs can cause this kind of thing. Yeah. Be careful. Yeah. Have it checked out. Any other thoughts? Watertown, do those of us living in this area really need vitamin D this time of the year? What's your take on that, Dan? Absolutely. Yes. There were, I went to a conference a few years ago, and there was a vitamin D expert there from Boston, and he gave a, an hour lecture on vitamin D, a, probably the best lecture I've ever heard. And he said, if you live north of Atlanta, Georgia, which I think Watertown is north of Atlanta, Georgia. I think it, just a bit. By a couple miles. But if you live north of Atlanta, Georgia, by April 30th, 83% of us are vitamin D deficient. So I take one supplement myself, vitamin D. I take it seasonally from the from 1st of November till the end of April. And I take about 2,000 units a day. Yeah. You might say, well, now the FDA says to take 400. Yeah. You know, well, there, there's a, a request that's gone into the FDA to increase it to 1,000. Uh, I think pretty much everybody agrees that the FDA is, is way too low for vitamin D. I tell my patients, if you're going to take vitamin D, if you're going to take it year-round, take 1,000 units year-round, take 2,000 if you take it seasonally. Yeah. Ask me if I take vitamin D. No. I do. Do you? No, I didn't ask you. Oh, well, you didn't <laughs> ask me. <laughs> I do take all right. it myself. Yeah. All right. So three for three, yeah. we take I vitamin think, D. I think we all do. All right. You take it, too. I do. I absolutely Three do. for three, vitamin D, 2,000. I take it year-round. It's hard not to get carried away when we fill our plates at Thanksgiving or Christmas dinners. Mm -hmm. We all know that the extra food can cause problems with which we will have to deal for several months. But with a bit of self-control, we can take our cake, eat, have our cake and eat it too. Or maybe during this time of the year, it's the pie that we can have. Mm -hmm. Mashed potatoes, sweet potato casserole, grandma's green bean casserole, and mom's apple pie. Do these foods sound like a part of your recent holiday gatherings? Most of these foods can be considered comfort foods or even traditional holiday foods. Comfort foods can certainly be a part of our diets in the winter. It's the how much and the how often that we need to pay attention to closely. Whether you are planning a menu for your family's holiday or just a weekly menu at home, focus on the balance or the how much. Use the plate method that is beautifully demonstrated by the choose my plate message. Focus on half of your plate being fruits or vegetables. 
Limit your protein to three to five ounces per meal. Add a serving of grain or a starch, and don't forget a cup of milk. Next, remember the how often. With numerous holiday gatherings each week or cravings for comfort foods each day, it can be very easy to include too many comfort foods too often. Take a step back, look at the events of the week and your menu plan for the week. Allow yourself some of these foods and some of these events, but try not to allow them more than just a few times per week. It is common for those who live in the cold winter states to gain weight and lose strength during the winter months. Having balance and limiting excessive calorie dense foods can help us to feel better during this time. And finally, getting plenty of exercise will help us maintain strength, prevent weight gain, and still be able to enjoy limited amounts of those foods that keep us comfortable during this time of year. Thank you, our dietitian Katie Vanderwall. What a plus she is, and the balance is the most important thing. And that's interesting. We only gain one pound, not five pounds, they said. Uh, of course, a lot of people talk about loginess. And I guess my answer to them is eat those festive days, but make sure you also exercise. What's your take home on, on the, all that food this time of year, you guys? You know, I think an idea is moderation. You don't need four helpings of something or, you know, just take the foods that you like and enjoy it. I mean, it's part of the holidays, but maybe just portion control and, uh, and keep moving. Yeah, so. Dan? I agree. I, um, I have been one that's probably eaten as much as I've wanted for, I'm now 52, for 50 years. I think I could eat anything and eat as much as I wanted. Now I realize I can't do that anymore. And so I'm learning moderation for the first yeah. time in my life. And I've, I've always had to have moderation since yeah. college. I kind of, I really grew. And the, the but the, the clue that I've done lately that has helped me is I have, I, I, I've filled the plate with smaller amounts and with the idea that I can come back and then Take your time, and then you go, I'm full. Why am I, why would I want to go back? So you don't just dump it on high and then eat it all and then go, ugh. One other challenge we're doing right now at our clinic is called the Healthy Hydration Challenge. Yeah. And, uh, and the challenge is just to drink more water in the course of a day. And I've actually really tried to incorporate it into my day, and I have noticed that, that I'm not as hungry. I, I drink more water, I trick my stomach into thinking it's full, and it is of something that has zero calories. Yeah. That's and, you know, sometimes I think we're thirsty and we think we're hungry and then we try and fill it with the wrong thing. Right. And, you know, I think some of us were raised um, with our moms all saying, clean your plate. Yeah. And I think now, you know, it's much better to slow down and maybe just savor and enjoy your food. It takes your um, brain a little while. It's a little slower than your stomach. Yeah, <laughs> I think. I think you're right. And so take your time, drink your water. Uh, savor your food and you probably end up eating less and it's okay to leave some on your plate when you're full. That's right. So quick answers. We got a oh, bunch of questions Gosh, here from okay. Freeman. If you are diagnosed with pneumonia, does the provider usually check to see if Legionnaires or, uh, or uh, amyloidosis? Well, uh, Legionnaires, yes. Uh, it, it, at our hospital, we have a... Uh, Atypical pneumonia check. Yeah, we have a... We have a mm -hmm. You can check for atypical pneumonias and it's just a little box that we check when we're doing admissions and so we do check for that. Um, amyloidosis is very rare and we would not check for that uh, unless we were, you know, we, we couldn't find anything else. Right. There's, there's clues that, that generally pop yeah. up. Uh, chest pain while shoveling uh, during the winter uh, season with shoveling snow. Do we have any clues about shoveling snow? People go after shoveling too hard, don't you think? I mean, what's the story about shoveling snow, Dan? Well, certainly it's a, it's a big risk factor for myocardial infarction or for angina, or myocardial ischemia. And so for, for people that are a um, little couch potato-ish and not very physically active, if you go out and start shoveling eight inches of snow, um, you're, you're kind of, you're, 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 it's, uh, you're doing a stress test like you would at the doctor's office, except the doctor's not there. So That's right. you gotta be, gotta be careful when you're shoveling snow, especially if you're not used to doing any type of that kind of physical activity. Right, if you're not in shape, don't do it. Mary, exactly. Right. Any other take And I would say too, if you start having some chest pain, don't just be a, you know, macho person and, and keep staying out there. Get it's to the time room. to to make a call and yeah. go to the ER. Yeah. Um, that's Exertional serious. chest pain. Yeah, that's, that's right. serious. That's it. Uh, anything about carbon monoxide? 
uh, poisoning this time of the year. I, I had a patient this week whose dad died of carbon mm -hmm. monoxide. And what had happened is a, a bird had uh, filled the chimney and the mother got sick because of the carbon monoxide. Mm -hmm. She went to the hospital, the kids went to the neighbors, and he died. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. oh my. Uh, and so uh, that's a real deal. That is we a real should, deal. You should really check your, your chimneys and the, and the vents as well, of the, uh, the sewer vents when the snow yeah. is, and it gets Have high. a carbon monoxide monitor. Make it's sure you a have one really a good idea, they're, they're absolutely. Right, what, what symptoms does a person have with carbon monoxide poisoning? I think most of the time, you know, people just become sluggish and, and, and don't act like themselves, you know, and-, and Confusion. And, and, and confusion, headaches, people, people will come in and say, you know, you're not right, what's wrong with you? And, and, and that can be a clue, but it's, it's very subtle. It's very hard for the individual themselves to identify it before it's too late. It might be interesting, mm -hmm. you know, if you, you, you do a blood test for carbon monoxide, mm -hmm. it's a nice sensitive test for it, unless you're a smoker. If you're a smoker, yeah, then. you got high levels of carbon monoxide in there, that, which is one little scary comment about smoking. Here's a Brookings 71-year-old aunt with pulmonary fibrosis. <clears throat> Normal uh, uh, na age of onset, please discuss pulmonary fibrosis. Mary, are you a pulmonary fibrosis person? Do you understand that one? <laughs> Dan does. What's, what it is? Well, pulmonary fibrosis is uh, it's a fairly common disease. It's basically hardening of your lungs. It's where your lungs become very scarred. dense and scarred and they don't expand. And it could occur for many reasons. People who've had multiple cases of pneumonia, for instance, could get pulmonary fibrosis. People can get it because of something they've inhaled through their career in their job, or it can be idiopathic, which means we don't know. Um, and it's, it's a not uncommon, it's a, it's a tough problem to fix because we don't have any good medicines no. to make it better quickly. No, and it, it's different than the asthma because yeah. they can get the air out. Asthma, you can't get blow the air all the way out. It takes a long, long, long time. Uh, they blow out fine, but it's just small volumes. Yeah. And you can diagnose it because it crackles. Like you cell can phone. hear it with a stethoscope yeah. very yeah. easily. Yeah. Yeah. Worthington, Minnesota caller read an article saying that eating processed meats like bacon can cause pancreatic cancer. Any truth to that? I don't know uh, that I've seen an article specific to that effect, but I think any, any uh, meat that is smoked or cured is probably not as healthy as one that is fresh. I think that's a great I answer, Mary. I think that's Mary. true. You know, I think that they say that uh, many of our cancers that used to be so common, such as gastric and that, as our mm -hmm. diets have changed and we eat less of that, I, I think some of those cancers have gone down. So I think there is an association with that. Uh, I think there is too, I've heard that. Winner, 72-year-old male suffers from sinus trouble, hay fever year-round, often worse in the winter. What, what can he do? I. I think steroid nasal sprays is a, a, a wonderful thing, and it's now over the counter. Do you? Do you I prescribe a ton of that stuff. That's probably I a good too. idea. And uh, I, I, I have people that take it year round and have for years. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it sounds to me like the problem is the underlying, um, you know, allergies are the underlying problem that predisposes to the sinus infection. Here's another pancreatic cancer. Uh, one of callers' par parents died from pancreatic cancer. Is caller at risk of this? Is it a genetic risk factor for pancreatic cancer? Uh, there are certain gene conditions that do have increased risk of uh, pancreatic cancer. I would say most of them probably are just, you know, something that we don't really understand why pancreatic cancer is there. <laughs> but there, um, but there certainly is some genetic things. You there know, the are some genetic, yes. uh, neoplasia things. Yep. Yes. And it runs with what thyroid disease, pa para parathyroid diseases, pituitary abnormalities. Yeah. When you see those things, uh, yeah. uh, kidney stones. You but, know, but much uh, pancreatic cancer would be a cancer that, uh, you know, it's, it's like the sixth most common cancer, but does not have the genetic predisposition that colon, breast, yeah, or, yeah. you know, uh, some of the other prostate cancer would. Those three, I would think much more about family history than with pancreatic. That's a great discussion, yeah. great answer. Good. Brookings, what is the uh, urinary sphincter paralysis? So the sphincter is the thing yeah, the that closes off, that closes. and when they lose the, the sphincter for eating, there's a lot of reasons, they, they have yeah. urinary incontinence, incontinence, and there's not much to do for it. It's a, it's tough, to fix. Yeah, it's no, a can, tough problem. They can go in and try to, try to surgically recreate one, 
uh, you know, which is done sometimes after men that have had prostate surgery that right. have this problem. Yeah. But that's about the only situation I'm familiar with it occurring in. Well, and if you have paralysis, I mean, if it's you lost a, the nerve to it, you have you to just figure out why did they get the paralysis, and uh, that's a tough problem. Yeah, I, I think you know, just catch it and live on. I mean, you know, there's, there, it's not the end of the world. Yeah, there's a lot worse things that you'd like to yeah. just put a pad on and go go out and yeah. hang with friends and not worry yeah. about it. That's right. easy for me to say, but I, I yeah. do think that staying in the igloo and being afraid, afraid, afraid of that is a bad thing. Caller, blood pressure is quite variable, has been put on medication and now his blood pressure is too low. Now I get that a lot. Yeah. They, you treat the high and then yeah, it gets, goes yeah. too low. And uh, what, what do you, you know, do you have any comments about that, you guys? Well, I think it's, a, it's not an uncommon thing. You know, as, certainly as we age, uh, the pulse pressure can increase. And the pulse pressure is the, the difference between your top number and your bottom number. You know, on most people, it's about a, a difference of 40. And as that number increases, you're, and as we age, that is more likely a problem, where yeah. you, that bottom number gets too low, especially, and then you become symptomatic. Right, and their mm -hmm. vessels get stiff, their heart stiff, and then when you lower that top number, down they go when they stand up. I, and you're much better yeah. off letting the pressures go high. I think they've adjusted some of the levels they that have, are recommended yeah. because of that very problem. Because, you know, let's let some of our elderly people run a little higher rather than run them low and have them fall and break a hip or something. Well, it's not good. The so. risk of the hypertension is uh, milder dementia and strokes. Mm -hmm. And we know that it occurs, but we know that that years and years and years to happen. Yeah. It's not going to happen overnight. And mm -hmm. falling and falling breaking a hip, a big problem. slamming your head against the wall or floor, that's not good either, is it? That no. happens quickly. That happens pretty yeah. quickly. Yank pretty 90, fatal. Pretty <laughs> so. fatal. 92, collar has been taught to wear yellow rubber gloves like those in the dishwashers to put support hose on and off. Our, our advisor, uh, Mr. Erickson, uh, doesn't use those, but I have advised rubber gloves to help put those hoses on. Uh, because it gives you a better grasp. Mm -hmm. You have you either one of you had experiences with? I that? have not. It's made it easier for this experience. Whatever you need to do to get whatever it, works. Wear yeah. those yeah, holes. Wear them. Whatever works. <clears throat> Baby powder can help put on support hose. Hey, how about that? Like it. Yeah. Collar has rheumatoid arthritis with uh, without nodules and has a harder time finding shoes that are uh, comfortable. Any suggestions? You know, uh, certainly, you know, they can, um, for diabetics, we make diabetic-specific uh, shoes, and they can actually mold the shoe for you. And, and you might go to a place that sells diabetic shoes and just say, hey, can you mold the shoe for me because I'm having a hard time finding a shoe that fits me in the regular world. I, I think finding diabetic shoes for rheumatoid arthritis is just exactly the right answer. Mm -hmm. So we've got just a half a minute left. Oh, Take-home messages, well, Mary. I'm going to say it, it's a... Uh, Beautiful South Dakota winter, and it's good to get out and enjoy and be with your friends and uh, just keep active. That's our that's our theme. There you go, uh, Dan. We, you, I, I've just got word. We got thirty seconds. Uh oh. Exercise. Maintain your weight, and if you can lose a little weight, do that and get your immunizations. I think yeah, if you can do those three and, and eat sensibly, if you do those things, you're going to be healthier. Well, Common uh, sense. It. Get your. Get your vaccinations, get your flu shot, and if you're sick, stay home. So stay home don't, if you're don't sick. spread it to the, <laughs> everyone around you. Great uh, winter uh, words of, of advice. We thank you so much for, for joining us today. Right. Hey, we'll be thanks, right back man. after this. But what if Mary comes out of the coma? I will forever be with you, even if she walked through that door right now. How's it going? Yo. You never know where you'll find the flu bug hanging around this time of year. Get vaccinated. It's free for children 18 and under. Because stopping the flu starts with you. It's been known for eons that in this northern clime, some people feel the winter blues set in when the nights become long. But it was a physician from the National Institutes of Health in the 1980s who first named that darkening of mood in winter as seasonal affective disorder, or SAD, sad. Paradoxically, with the holiday season, mood can significantly sadden in 5 to 20% of us, depending upon somewhat on 
how northern your exposure may be. Some people are just minimally affected, but those with a major depressive illness or manic depressive condition may be severely impaired by seasonal change. Certainly those who socialize poorly, move less, live in darker places, and hibernate indoors are the, at much higher risk for wintertime blues. The theory is that long nights alter melatonin and serotonin brain chemical levels, changing our biologic clocks. Some experts think as SAD is a reflection of thousands of generations when food was scarce in winter, making it necessary to turn down and do less. It's not hard to believe that body juices and thus mood can be influenced by light. Just think how poinsettia leaves turn red or the Christmas cactus blossoms as our winter sets in. Maybe it's not wrong to settle in on our your favorite couch in front of a warm fire wrapped in a throw, engrossed in a good book with a hot cup of your favorite winter beverage. Maybe even snatch a nap. Perhaps we should allow ourselves to take a little time to recharge before the excitement and high energy of spring and summer. But we cannot forget how physical exercise every day keeps the doctor away. Winter without exertion means a springtime of weakness and injury. We must keep fit, even during the winter weather, and even if that means exercise, exercising indoors. I read one report that those living in Iceland do not struggle with SAD. It's thought their lifestyle of rigorous outdoor winter physical activity, exposure to winter sun, and diet of vitamin D saturated fish is the tonic that prevents sadness. For those who are possibly harmed by a bad mood brought on by the darker winter season, you might benefit from the Icelandic attitude of regular exercise daily, plenty of early morning light, outdoor sun when possible, and a diet that includes enough fish or and vitamin D. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's okay to take some time this winter to cozy up and recharge a little too. Well, this brings us to the end of our show this evening. For more of this discussion and answers to the questions we didn't answer during the show, join us for After Hours by going to our website, oncalltv.org. I sincerely thank our fantastic guests tonight, Drs. Mary Milroy and Dan Meegard from Yankton. Thank you very much, both thank you. of you. Thank you, Rick. Writer John Steinbeck knew why we have seasons. Good is the warmth of summer without the cold of winter to give it sweetness. And until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Welcome. If you suffer from chronic pain, it can be a burden on your life that may be unbearable. But how do you keep the regular use of pain medication from turning to abuse? Pain medication, use and abuse. Next time on Call with the Prairie Doc. for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. 
Larson Manufacturing is proud to support on-call television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding is provided by Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Care, Dakota Dermatology, the Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided by the generous support of Avera, Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. Hello and welcome to On Call After Hours, where we answer the questions we weren't able to get to during the broadcast portion of our show. All of your questions are important to us and we want to answer as many as we can for you. And we had some great questions. Good, good questions. Here's from Minnesota, 84-year-old woman, what causes twitching muscles in the legs? That's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, and there may not be a good answer, but there will be an answer. But give, um, give it anyway. You know, uh, and I have had some of that uh, myself where I get a little muscle group that twitches. And, and sometimes it can be related to physical activity. If you're doing a different activity, sometimes we'll see that, you know. Uh, and, uh, but, but I think in most cases, we can do tests and we can, we can look at your electrolytes in your labs and stuff. And to be honest, we don't find anything. I've had people say, oh, it was the calcium. I took calcium tablets, they went away. I've advised that, made no difference. Right. It's the potassium. Oh, I've got low potassium. You check, it's not the problem. But I think that the biggest problem with leg spasms that I've seen, which is a little different than the right. twitching, mm -hmm. the leg spasms that I've seen is when the edema goes in and out. Somebody who has mm -hmm. edema in their legs, and the best yeah. answer is use those support hose mm -hmm. and get the edema out with elevation and walking and maybe diuretics but you need to get it out and then keep it out. <clears throat> uh, twitching, I think exercising okay. induced, yeah. Uh, Del Rapid, 76 year old woman, what causes neuropathy in the legs? That's another sim similar deal. Well, most, most people are, are gonna just assume it's related to diabetes mm -hmm. and diabetes is a very common cause, but to be honest, the most common cause is idiopathic, which means we don't know. Mm -hmm. It can be associated with a huge number of conditions, um, but it's a very frustrating problem for the patient and also for the physician because, you know, we can maybe give you some medicine to decrease the symptoms by 50%, but we can't cure it. A little amitriptyline, mm -hmm. a little uh, Neurontin. Uh, yep. Yeah. 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 Mary, any uh, no, addition to I'm that? No, I'm going to say it's kind of a tough one, you yeah. know. It's yeah. a... I, you know what I do? I give them all B12 because I don't think B12 sure. levels are very safe, or, I mean, are, very, are, are, are always answered 
uh, when B12 deficiency is there. I've had almost normal levels or, or normal levels, you know, low normal levels in people gave them B12 and the numbness went away. Okay. I had one other cool. person who had numbness all over their mouth <clears throat> and they were taking uh, zinc and we stopped the zinc and the numbness went away. Oh, wow. wow. I've, I've seen it with thyroid disease too where mm -hmm. they're hypothyroid, you replace the thyroid and the neuropathy goes away. Right. But not very many reversible causes. Yeah, yeah. you gotta check the thyroid, check the B12, mm -hmm. take a thousand of B12 and, and see if that helps. Yeah. Watertown, which patients need the injection to improve bone health? Does it really work? Prolia. Are you a, are you a big fan of uh, any of these bone density uh, meds? Um, I don't know if I would be qualified as a big fan. I think I think they have their place. You know, I think for people that have osteoporosis, you know, certainly the insurance company is not going to cover it unless you have osteoporosis. If you have osteopenia, which is just a decrease in the density of bone to some degree. Uh, insurance is going to cover it, and so, um, you know, but for, you'd have to have osteoporosis based on a bone density study in order for this drug to be covered. Um, I've used and this other, drug. And other drugs, too. Yeah, yeah. I've, used this, oh, yeah. I've used this drug minimally. Um, I think it has a place, but I've not used it a lot as of yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm going to say a lot of times I think it's good for people to know what their bone density is. And that, you know, we've been really kind of talking about exercise, but I can tell you, That's you know, point. if you do some bone loading exercise and you take some uh, calcium and vitamin D, you know, maybe you don't ever need that stuff. Yeah, so I, keep on top of it. You know, when it is just maybe some uh, mild change, it's bone loading um, and it's that stress on your bones that strengthens them yeah, yeah. Uh, with good calcium. And, you know, I think what's happening is, you know, so many people nowadays are, you know, drinking a lot of soda pop and they're not having milk Phosphates and water and it's leaching it out of the bones yeah. and so i think uh, dietary and exercise goes a long way right. with that yeah. and it it starts for women you know starting a couple years before menopause is where the bone density just takes a dive for the worse so that's when women because this is a bigger problem in women than men that's when women really need to be aware of their bone health is you know within a couple years of menopause yeah. is, is take control. <clears throat> Why would you take a pill when it's the exercise that makes oh, the yeah. difference? I totally agree with you. And That's, drink your and, milk. And, drink and, some and, milk and calcium and not so much soft drinks. Uh, Yankton, 55-year-old okay. caller is uninsured and has lupus. He does research uh, on the web trying to help himself and reduce costs. Any advice about lupus, either one of you? Well, lupus is an autoimmune disease, you know, and it can affect everybody differently. It affects a lot of different organ systems in the body, and, uh, you know, it's very varied from one individual to the next. You know, there can be lupus that involves only the skin, uh, but there can be lupus that involves internal organs, you know. Uh, specifically, it likes, uh, uh, you know, it likes joints. It likes some other internal organs. It can affect most anything, your brain, your kidney. Um, your heart, yeah. yeah, you know, so it's 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 a it's a, it's a tough disease, but, uh, you know, very similar to, let's say, cancer, in that there can be very mild cases of cancer, there can be very severe cases of cancer, and lupus has a huge spectrum. The treatment would be based on where you lie in that spectrum. Right, and, and those I try to define as well as I can, and then I hand them to the rheumatologist, because yeah. it's a cutting edge, advancing it, thing. It, isn't it is, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of different drugs they can treat with, but most of them are very expensive, which may not be an option for this caller. That's right. But you know, even that, I think it's good to, um, you know, don't just do it alone. Work together, partner with your family physician, your primary care provider, to make sure that you do have good ongoing kind of uh, longitudinal care for that because it is such a spectrum. They can help you look out for some of the danger signs. So it's, don't do it alone. Don't do it alone. And, the, and methyltrexate, if that's usable in some cases, it's not that expensive. It's a pretty, pretty cheap option, which has been around a long time. <clears throat> Here's from Sioux Falls. Related to early question about mixed martial arts, how do you feel about cage fighting? Is it okay for our community? <laughs> that's Ooh, a great ouch. question. <laughs> <clears throat> Per I've never seen a cage fight myself. Uh, yeah. so per I personally, uh, I wouldn't jump in a cage myself. I'd be concerned about oh. the long-term health outcomes and, and, and the short-term health outcomes, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah, you think of, it. well, and, and yeah. the head trauma, you know, and repeated head trauma, you, you get concerned about the Parkinsonian effects of that. Muhammad Ali, all the times he was hit in the head, he's kind of the poster child for head trauma. Yeah, head so trauma. Yeah. Uh, I'd be very careful. I, I'm not a fan of it. 
Um, how do you get rid of the cellulitis in the uh, antibiotic? Oh, the cellulitis in the antibiotics and prednisone. Um, Antibiotics and prednisone has been tried. How do you get rid of cellulitis, lower leg in a diabetic? So cellulitis in the lower leg of a diabetic, tough, tough, tough area. Very. I would say, number one, support hose. Support hose. Elevate the leg, get the edema out. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and you know, if, if there's truly an infection there, you're going to need antibiotics. And because you're diabetic and, and there's an infection under the skin, any bug that you can imagine is possible. For a non-diabetic, you're gonna think of bugs that are on our skin, staph and strep. But for a diabetic, any bug that you can think of is, is a possibility. So it's, it's a much more difficult problem in a diabetic than in a non-diabetic. I, I would say the biggest issue is to get the edema out. The edema. And the way to do that is wrap with ACE wrap, support hose, elevate, diuretics, anything and everything to get the edema out because if you get a, uh, you know, the, the infection set in, and you, the only way you're going to get that antibiotic in there is get that edema out. But that's mm -hmm. hard for people. Yeah. yeah. Here's the last question oh, wow. from Vermilion. How often should a, a woman get a mammogram after the age of 50? Okay. Mary. All right. Um, I'm going to say there's probably some controversy about how often to get mammograms. Uh, most people do believe that. Um, every year is what most of the national organizations here, I know there's some places that go every mm -hmm. two years, but um, I would say most of the national organizations in the United States are still standing by uh, mm -hmm. the yearly, although I will say that um, there are a number of national organizations that have task forces examining that right away, I mean right now, so right. I think it's a moving target. I would say stay <clears throat> tuned. Right now yearly is a good idea, but um, I know that both the American Cancer Society and the U.S. Preventive uh, Service Task Force ha are forming, uh, they have groups right. working on it right now. So kind of stay tuned, we'll, they're looking at the evidence right now. I think the ACP came up with uh, every other year if you've had negatives after yeah. a period of time. Yeah. How about after 70? You know, I think that's a judgment call between you and probably your primary care provider. You know, I think if a person, we have people who are 70 and they are 50. active and healthy yeah. and they are 50. I think you have to say, um, you know, what's your, you, you're, you know, you can have a very elderly 60 and a real young 80. And so I think you have to say, what's risk and benefit? You know, yeah. we know that there's downsides to do mammograms. Maybe we have you get callbacks or biopsies. And if you are 90 in a nursing home, uh, you know, you, you know, we probably aren't going to help Forget you. We're not going to help you. So no. that's a good time to stop. But if you are 70 and healthy and, you know, your average life expectancy could be 85 or 90, well, you've got 25 or 30 years on the line, and then it might make a huge difference. Right. Final questions that you, you should answer. Here's a bunch of questions that you had thought about. Yeah, Have you thought ahead. about any sure. final? I, I know we got a lot of talk about breast yeah. cancer. Dan, one final. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let me refresh my memory. Uh, um, You know, uh, I guess one last thought would be on fall avoidance in the wintertime, you know, and, and I think probably the most important thing is oh. we, we've all had this beautiful ice storm here in the last few oh. days that covered all of eastern South Dakota, and I went out. Uh, we had a, a bunch of kids that came to our house last night, and I told my son, let's go out and, and chip the ice off the, the sidewalk and, or the, the driveway, and I think I about fell down three times, you know, trying to do that. So the uh, main thing is wear appropriate shoes, something that's got a rubber base that you're not going to slip on. If you don't normally shovel, don't begin in a storm. Hire the neighbor kid because they're gonna do it for 20 bucks and they need the money anyway. Right. And uh, <laughs> yeah, if, if you good. use a cane, make sure you have your cane when you're out there and make sure you replace the tip on the cane. And then when you come in the house, take your shoes off right away yeah. because you might have snow or ice underneath them and you walk on a hardwood floor or on linoleum yeah. and you're gonna, you're gonna slide inside instead of out. And dress warmly, avoid hypothermia, avoid frostbite. Oh. Um, so dress appropriately. Dress and you know, any of us who've had teenagers, sometimes we know that you have to kind of check them before they leave the yes. house. <laughs> They're wearing t-shirts. T-shirts. Yes. And you know, You're wrong. carry yeah. a survival kit so you got some, you know, good warm boots. You know, what if you have some car trouble? So, so what a joy to have you. Thank you so, again so much anyway, for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for joining us on our website. We appreciate all of your questions and the opportunity to answer them. 
Be sure to join us next week on South Dakota Public Broadcasting at our regular time and call in your or email your questions and then watch for Prairie Doc Perspective column in your local newspaper. Listen to your Prairie Doc Conversation radio show on station near you and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest. And until right. next time, stay healthy out there, people. All right. Good. Good. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.